Yeah. We're going to... It's a full <laughs> class. <laughs> Probably not good. Right. It's not, it's, 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 it's not you, it's me. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh. I'm pretty sure there's a bunch of people that are stuck in the snow. Oh, yeah. Robert's just not park. Okay. <laughs> Wait, is he the one who's parked up on that snowbank? No. Oh. He's the one who's tried parking over here. Oh. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. Nice. All right, so I am uh, going to do lecture 8.2 today, thermal system elements. You know, it's been a few days, been a minute since we met, so like, let's review just briefly. We were in chapter 8 of the dynamic systems notes, and uh, in this chapter we, we are going over fluid and thermal system elements, well, fluid and thermal systems and learning how to do lumped parameter modeling uh, uh, for these systems. And we introduced fluid systems the last time we met, uh, which was a while ago now. <laughs> but um, we learned how to do lumped parameter modeling of fluid systems and uh, all the way to linear graph modeling. And uh, today we're going to introduce the last energy domain that we'll consider in this course, the thermal systems energy domain. Are those yogurt pretzels? Mm -hmm. oh, okay. Uh, no, I, oh yes, maybe, yeah, huh? Whoa, <laughs> nice. Perfect. Oh yeah. Good as I remember. They're so good. <laughs> yogurt pretzels, I mean, they almost sound like they could be healthy, but they're probably not. What do you mean they sound like they could be healthy? It's probably oh, like white chocolate, not even, not even yogurt. So, but it's good. That was a good throw, by the way. I lined up perfect. You did. I should have just, uh -huh. but I know I would like chip the tooth or something. I'm not graceful about this. Stuff. Choking. Probably would not be oh yeah, right. That'd be a bad way to go. You know, that's like one of the ways to die that gets on national news as like and like all the radio shows. Man dies <laughs> catching a pretzel. Yeah. Um, <laughs> okay. So thermal system elements. Um, systems in which heat flow is of interest are called thermal systems. For instance, heat generated by an engine or a server farm, two important examples, um, flows through several bodies via the three modes of heat transfer, conduction, convection, and radiation. This is, of course, a dynamic process that unfolds in time. Now, you have a whole course on heat transfer. Uh, you did In physics, you learned about these three modes of heat transfer, conduction, convection, and radiation. You may have done some labs on it depending on where you did uh, physics. And uh, we'll, in your senior year, the heat transfer course will go into detail about these three different modes of heat transfer. Um, but we're going to learn how to do lumped parameter modeling. Once again, this is not a replacement for a distributed uh, uh, model, a detailed model that would require a spatial continuum where every single uh, point in space has its own unique temperature, for instance. Um, what we're going to do is uh, uh, this lumped parameter modeling like we've been doing with these other types of systems. Um, and once again, you know, this is not a replacement for the distributed model, but distributed models uh, are maybe more important in fluid, in fluid dynamics than they are in in uh, thermal dynamics. Ooh, it's like treat day today. Thank you. Kit Kat. It's been a while. Mm, okay. Uh, so, I've gotten a lot of treats in the last 24 hours. I also got a box of chocolates for Valentine's Day. And I was like, it's a good, it's a good day. And I treated myself to an Aurora concert. Did you actually go? I went by myself and enjoyed it. Nice. Mm-hmm. It was amazing. 
So she moved like that? Oh, yeah. She's an actual angel. It's true. So, yeah, it was really fun. Um, so, um, the distributed model is probably more important, like, in, in fluid mechanics than it is in thermal systems. But... As you'll see in the heat transfer course, it is still important. So we're not replacing that. We're giving a different approach. So we're often concerned with, say, the maximum temperature an engine will reach for different speeds or the maximum density of a server farm while avoiding overheating. Or, more precisely, how a given heat generation affects the temperature response of system components. And that type of example um, is, I would say, much more common than needing to know what the temperature is at every single location in your system at all times. So uh, as with electrical, mechanical, and fluid systems, we can describe thermal systems as consisting of discrete lumped parameter elements. The dynamic models that can be developed from considering these elements are often precisely the right granularity for system level design. An example um, of when this would be useful, I mean, even though we're going to say, well, this is really approximate, blah, 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 which is true, um, but it's effective for doing things like this that arises pretty frequently. Say you're a mechanical engineer at a company that makes some sort of device that has a, uh, say, a DC power supply inside the housing. A really common situation that this would happen in. Um, and you're given the task of designing the ventilation for the box, whatever the box does. Um, and you're given some constraints where, you know, you can use this space for a vent. You can, like, have this much space for a fan, etc. And they also tell you we can't have the temperature inside the box reach um, uh, a certain t temperature or uh, uh, higher. So it has to stay below a certain temperature threshold. And they give you, like, different... Things like, okay, the, the, this, uh, uh, this block, or you might have to go find out, uh, what is the maximum power that the power supply is going to need to be uh, putting out for whatever it's being used for? And then how much heat is that going to generate inside the box? And you could come up with a very, very detailed... 3D model includes like all of the boards that are in there and all of the geometry and gory detail and discover, you know, okay, the maximum heat transfer, or maximum temperature is going to be this, but that could take months of analysis and uh, would require advanced simulation software. Um, and it's still unclear that that would give you a good answer. <laughs> sometimes it would, but sometimes uh, it would be limited um, as well. So what you could do instead is take a more system design approach and say, okay, I'm going to treat this like convective heat transfer problem. I need to make sure that the air flows over this block at a certain speed. I'll approximate this block as being a rectangular block, and this is the surface area that comes into contact with the air that's moving past it. Um, how fast should I make that air flow over it to get to keep the temperature below a certain amount when we have this like power ramp up or whatever? Um, and you could develop a dynamic model might take you an afternoon to develop this like linear graph model, come up with a simulation of what the temperature would look like uh, for these lumped elements, and say, okay, I need the speed of the, f of the air to be this fast across it in order to stay under the temperature that I need with some generous factor of safety, 
And so I'm going to need to size my fan accordingly. Choose your fan, choose your fan speed, and then you, you're good to go. So that, that would be how you would use this type of analysis for design without having to go down the like simulate everything route, which is kind of, I think we should be cautious of that because it didn't used to be possible to just like simulate all the details, right? So people would develop these techniques. But nowadays, you know, you can use like ComSol or something to give like a really detailed this, uh, model of how the heat would flow inside this chassis or whatever. Like you can, you can do that, but often that's not necessary um, and may not even give you what you want to know either at the end of the day. So, so thinking about uh, which tool is the right tool for the design problem that you have um, is important. So I, that's just like kind of a general comment. I keep bringing us back to this because I think a lot of times we get caught up in the how to do the analysis and not so much like when should we use this analysis <laughs> discussion. And I think we need to make sure we uh, think, think about that too. And that's the hardest thing. Uh, and that's what comes with, with experience, uh, but also that doesn't mean that we have to learn by failing all the time at it either. So have discussions about it. Okay, so we now introduce a few lumped parameter elements for modeling thermal systems. Let a heat flow rate Q, which has SI units watts, and temperature T, which has SI units Kelvin or Celsius, be input to a port in a thermal element. There are three structural differences between thermal systems and other types we've considered. Other types we've considered so far are mechanical translational, mechanical rotational, uh, uh, electrical, and fluid. So now our last one is, is thermal. Um, so three structural differences uh, between thermal and the other types. So the, so the thermal one's the weird one. Okay. We're confronted with the first here. When we consider that heat power uh, is typically not considered to be the product of two variables, uh, rather the heat flow rate Q is already power. So heat flow rate is power. It's in watts. It's in joules per second. It's in energy per unit time. So that's different. And, and it is something that's uh, conventional about that, like we already use heat flow as being a, uh, a variable to describe thermal energy moving around. There's also something that's kind of basic about thermal energy, um, and we're going to see it show up in a couple other contexts. These three differences kind of arise from this um, kind of like different type of energy that we're dealing with here. And, and I, there's probably, there probably is some sort of like deep understanding of the physics that could be, uh, you know, teased out here, but I don't quite, I can't quite put my finger on how to describe that. But it kind of emerges from this picture of like, oh, um, the, what will become our through variable, the heat flow rate is just the power that's, that's flowing around. It's just the energy that's moving around per unit time. So, yeah, uh, good. A thermal element has two distinct locations between which its temperature drop is defined. We call a reference temperature ground. We call reference anything with an across variable in this class ground. So we'll use that terminology again. You can call it a reference if you want it. This, I changed this slightly in the notes just to get a little bit more in sync with typical terminology. So um, uh, you might go back through this like one paragraph and see what the differences are if you printed out your notes before today. Uh, the heat energy H of a system with initial heat H of zero is the integral of the power or equivalently the integral of the heat flow rate. Great. So uh, one notational thing, uh, the textbook 
and uh, I use H for heat energy. The typical symbol for this in like your thermo class is Q, right? And H is enthalpy. We're not going to talk about enthalpy in this class. You're welcome. Um, <laughs> no one likes enthalpy. <laughs> okay, uh, great. So we now consider an element that can store energy called an energy storage element. Oh, there was a typo I forgot to fix. It's down here. Um, and with a uh, resist power flow and two elements that can supply power from outside a system called source elements. The second difference between thermal systems and the other types we've considered uh, is that there is only one type of energy storage element in the thermal domain, and it's the thermal capacitor. So when heat is stored in an object, it stores potential energy via its temperature. This is analogous to how an electronic capacitor stores its energy via its voltage. For this reason, we call such thermal elements thermal capacitors. A linear thermal capacitor with thermal capacitance C, with SI units joules per Kelvin, temperature T and heat H use the constitutive equation H equals CT. Once again, time differentiating the constitutive equation gives us the elemental equation. So if we do dH dt equals C dt dt, C is a constant, and we solve for dt dt, we recognize that dH dt is by definition our heat flow rate, Q. Um, we have this as our elemental equation, and we're off to the races with our thermal capacitors. When we see them, we can write an elemental equation, um, this elemental equation. The thermal capacitance C is an extensive property. That is, it depends on the amount of its substance. This is opposed to the specific heat capacity, little c, with units joules per kelvin per kilogram, SI units, uh, an intensive property, which is one that is independent of the amount of its substance. These quantities are related for an object of mass m by the equation that C equals mc. And this is this difference between an extensive and an intensive property. I asked the other section, and I think they said that they learned this in thermo. Um, which is an important concept that shows up a lot, so uh, um, we're seeing it show up here. Something to note is that thermal capacitance, um, the extensive property that we're going to use mostly in this class, um, it will often, that term, thermal capacitance, you'll hear uh, um, people talk about the the uh, specific heat capacity. Sometimes they're going to just say heat capacity. They won't say specific. And you kind of have to tell from context what they mean. So like, for instance, somebody says the heat capacity of copper. They mean the intensive property of copper, because they didn't say how much copper. If they said the heat capacity of one kilogram of copper, then they probably mean the the extensive property, so what we call the heat capacitance, thermal capacitance, but they could call the heat capacity. Um, just the terminology is a little bit loose that people use here, and so I I try to be really precise with the terminology, but just know that like in other literature it won't necessarily be. So you have to tell from uh, uh, context and from the units that are given which version you're getting. Um, if it's any sort of general property of a substance or an element, then you're talking about specific intrinsic properties. If it's something that's specific to an object with a certain amount of mass, that's extensive. So, good. Thermal resistors. So these are defined as elements for which the heat flow rate Q through the element is a monotonic function of the, of the this is the other, this is the typo, temperature drop 
not pressure drop. T, across it. Linear thermal resistors have constitutive equation and elemental equation. Q equals 1 over RT, or T equals RQ. Either one is fine, where R is the thermal resistance. So there's a proportional relationship between the heat flowing through it and the temperature across it. So question, if there is no temperature difference across a substance that we're approximating as being a thermal resistor, uh, will there be any heat flow through it? If it's the same temperature? On both sides, yeah. So, so T is the temperature across the element. Um, if the temperature is the same on both sides, T is zero, right? So Q is zero. So there's no heat flow rate. So it means that if you don't have a temperature difference on two sides, heat's not going to flow. The thing that drives heat flow is having a temperature difference. And that's very, very analogous, well, it's quite analogous, I guess, to how we think of uh, voltage and current, right? We think of voltage, if there's a voltage difference across an electrical resistor, then current will flow through the resistor. If there's no voltage across it, if the voltage on one side is the same as the voltage on the other side, then there will be no current flowing through the resistor. So this is just like a, uh, a resistor in the electrical energy domain, um, but it works for thermal systems. So we're going to think about that. So we're going to uh, actually approximate most substances as having some sort of thermal resistance to heat flowing through it. The thing that makes heat flow through it is the temperature difference. Thermal resistors, so this is a little bit different. Uh, thermal resistors do not dissipate energy from the system, which is the third difference between thermal and other energy domains we've considered. After all, other resistive elements, so we've looked at electrical resistors, we looked at uh, mechanical dampers, and we looked at fluid dampers, right? Um, or, or fluid resistors, we called them. Uh, those three all dissipate energy to heat, okay? But this is already heat. So if you dissipate energy to heat from heat, kind of doing some mental gymnastics there, and really you're back to where you started. You have heat energy. It doesn't actually go anywhere, right? So there's nothing else to go down further in the sort of uh, uh, entropic sense of organizational heat. And uh, we are at the, we're at the bottom floor of energy, uh, 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 of entropy, I guess you could say. Um, so well, I guess with entropy, it would be the top floor. I don't know. Entropy is weird. Big entropy means disorganized. Right? Entropy is always going to grow. It doesn't even get smaller globally. Mo a lot of my research is actually making entropy get smaller locally. <laughs> so I guess that I guess that entropy is like think uh, it's um, think globally and act locally or something just like the good slogan goes I don't know anyways uh, great so rather than dissipate energy what, what I mean what does it do so it was got the other resistive elements all dissipated energy. So what does it do? It actually just impedes the flow of energy. So the higher the resistance, the more difficult it is for heat to flow through it, but it doesn't actually dissipate any heat, which is actually similar to the other types of resistors. Um, like if you increase the resistance of an electrical resistor, it's harder for current to flow through that resistor, right? So that is similar. 
Um, but the resistor also, the, the, the electrical resistor also dissipates energy, which the thermal resistor does not. All three modes of heat transfer are modeled by thermal resistors, but only two of them are well approximated as linear for a significant range of temperature. Uh, so conduction and convection are the first two, and then radiation is not great for linear stuff, but we'll talk about it for a minute. So conduction, uh, heat conduction is the transfer of heat through an object's microscopic particle interaction. Uh, it is characterized by a thermal resistance, R, uh, which we say for an object is equal to the length in the direction of heat transfer divided by the cross-sectional area transverse to the, to the flow of, of heat transfer. And uh, uh, rho is the material's thermal conductivity, which is um, the reciprocal of its of its uh, resistivity, which is another thing that you see. So those are both intrinsic properties of an object, whereas um, uh, the resistance is an extrinsic property. So this resistance, R, uh, somebody asked me to draw a, a, a picture earlier, so I'll draw it again here. Um, so you've got a heat source. I take this opportunity to draw a candle. I don't get a lot of opportunities to draw a candle, so I just had to take them where I get them. Candle, heat source, and, whoa. It's not, it's kind of fun to draw. I like drawing. Uh, and let's say we've got heat transfer going from that through this object. Oh, yeah. Oh, no, I really screwed that up, didn't I? Whoosh. Lop that off. Look at that. Amazing. Uh, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. You get me. Get me. It's good. Okay, so heat's transferring through uh, this object. And we're going to say that, so the heat source is over here. There, it's weird because, you know, heat transfer happens in a three-dimensional world, right? Nothing is ever one-dimensional. But there are a lot of situations that we encounter where we can think of primarily heat is flowing in one direction. And what's going on in the transverse directions uh, is pretty uniform. So say you had this situation. Most of the heat's going to flow through the object with conduction um, uh, from this hot side to this cold side um, and assuming that you have a material that is oh what is the word isotropic is it the right word it's iso something um, <laughs> that has the same uh, thermal properties in all directions uh, you are you are going to get pretty much uniform flow across the whole plate now, across the whole object. Now, that's not perfectly true, right? Uh, there's always some three-dimensional sort of effects that are going on, but we can approximate it that way in a lot of cases. Not in every case, though. Sometimes you have to model the whole block and what the heat's doing in the whole block. So uh, if we are thinking like this, heat's flowing through the block from maybe side one to side two, if that far side over there is two, maybe I'll do it this way. This is side one, and this, watch that, boom, oh wow, that's side two, just like that, flowing from one to two, then this is L, the length in the direction of heat transfer, and the cross-sectional area would be the area of this rectangle, this cross-sectional rectangle here. So, yeah, there's no great way to denote that, but I'll just say A. So, 
that's what the thermal resistance um, is. And we're assuming that it has some constant conductivity rho, so some, some material that's uniform. Okay, so that's our, our thermal resistance. Um, that is a conductive heat transfer um, uh, resistance. Now, a resistance that, that models convection, um, uh, we'll now consider. So heat convection is the transfer of heat via fluid advection. The bulk motion of a fluid is characterized by a thermal resistance, 1 over HA, where H is the convection heat transfer coefficient, and A is the area of uh, fluid-filled object contact, or fluid object contact. So this H is what you spend most of, <laughs> I don't know about most, a good chunk of heat transfer class is going to be talking about how to find H for a given situation. Now, you might say, gosh, this seems like it would be hard, um, uh, and it is. The convection heat transfer coefficient is highly nonlinearly dependent um, um, on the velocity of the fluid, okay? So, like, the velocity of the fluid, the geometry, the contact area, there's all kinds of stuff that comes into determining uh, uh, the resistance for a convective heat transfer resistance. Um, you'll have this whole discussion about, okay, a sphere in a fluid with, with you know, velocity below this certain velocity of the fluid, and you have, like, laminar flow versus turbulent flow. What is the heat transfer coefficient for these different situations? It's like, it all, it's all there, okay? It's a very complex situation. Um, really approximating all of it as H is, is a bit of a sort of nice fiction that we use, right? It's, oh, it's just some H, which, I mean, is essentially assigning a number to something that uh, is a pretty complex phenomenon. Now, it is still effective for doing the system level design. So in that example that we used of having a chassis and you needed to figure out like how big your fan should be. Like that's what you wanted to answer, but you couldn't answer that question without doing some analysis and figuring out like how big should the fan be, how fast should this fan be going. Um, you could say, okay, I don't know what it is for like some, you know, really weird shaped object with fluid flow, you know, very complex, and maybe there are like vortices coming off of it. I'm like, I don't know what the convective heat transfer coefficient is for that. Um, so I'm, I'm screwed. Like that's, that's not what you do. What you do is you say, okay, well, this maybe, you know, in that box that your, your power supply looks, well, maybe it looks kind of rectangular. And then you're like, okay, if it's rectangular, then, uh, well, it's close to rectangle. We'll just call it a rectangle. We'll lop off some of these corners and we'll, we'll, uh, we'll say, okay, what is the heat transfer coefficient if you've got fluid flowing uniformly over a box that uh, 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 has, you know, one side on the ground or whatever and you've got uh, uh, a boundary layer that forms and all that. What is the heat transfer coefficient for that? Well, that's the type of thing that's been studied quite a bit, like the, with these simple geometries. And so you could come up with a heat transfer coefficient approximation based on that. Or you could do some tests as well. You could, you could do some fitting to some test data and figure out what your heat transfer coefficient might be approximately. And then you'd be able to use your model to determine how... Uh, uh, maybe how large your fan needs to be to really keep it cool. So that's, that's your, um, I remember I used to get really discouraged because it, it, it's true that these are very approximate. Every model that we come up with is an approximation of what's really going on in the world, right? Even the very, very detailed models are approximations. So, I mean, maybe, maybe quantum mechanical systems you can say are approximations, but they're also probabilistic, so 
I don't know. Yeah, in any case, uh, uh, the question is always, what do we want to know about this system? And what detail of model do we need in order to get an answer to that question? And that's, that's what, what, what we're doing here. We're trying to come up with models that are design tools for us. Okay, now radiation is the one that's the toughest. So I, I'd say this is an increasing order of difficulty for analysis. So uh, conduction's the easiest, convection's a little harder, and then radiation sucks. So radiative heat transfer <laughs> is electromagnetic radiation emitted from one body and absorbed by another. For T1 being the absolute temperature of a hot body, T2 the absolute temperature of a cold body, <laughs> Epsilon, the effective emissivity or absorptivity, and A, the area of the exposed surfaces, the heat transfer is characterized by this equation where sigma is the Stefan-Boltzmann constant, which uh, is not the Boltzmann constant, confusingly. It's the Stefan-Boltzmann constant. So important distinction. They're different by a lot. So if, if your numbers are very wrong, you might want to check your Boltzmann constant. Stefan Boltzmann is the one you want. Um, clearly, this heat transfer is highly nonlinear. Linearization is problematic because the temperature difference, T, between the bodies does not appear in the expression. So it's kind of hard to write down. Uh, a, a linearization problem. I, I have never seen this actually worked out with radiation as part of the lump parameter model before. Um, but I want to do I want to do one just to I have some ideas on how we how it could be done. Uh, I think it'd be fun. Uh, for many system models, radiative heat transfer is assumed negligible. We must be cautious with this assumption, however. Uh, especially when high operating temperatures are anticipated. So one thing that you can do, this is what I recommend you do if you, uh, when you're doing a, an analysis of a problem, if everything's pretty, like nothing's like super high temperature or super cold temperature, because it's the temperature difference that really matters. Um, if you've got things that are all around the same temperature, probably okay. Um, if you have things that are very high temperature and some things that are at room temperature that are near each other, then you got to start thinking, okay, maybe I need to take this into account. And what I would do is, is do, a, do a conservative um, back of the envelope calculation of what is my Q for like the worst case of temperature differences you can imagine just calculate that. So like it isn't part of your dynamic model, but just calculate what it would be. And then uh, what you can do is you can say, okay, how does that Q compare to the Qs that I'm seeing from my conductive heat transfer and from my convective heat transfer? And if it's, you know, small compared to them, then you can probably neglect it um, and be just fine. If it's significant, if it's like, you know, 25% of what the other heat transfer is or more, then I would say, okay, uh, you might consider trying to come up with a more complex model that includes radiation. It is a little bit tough to include it, but it is important in certain problems. So, important to keep in mind. Okay. Heat flow and temperature sources. So thermal sources include many physical processes. Almost everything generates heat. I mean, every machine generates heat. Every um, uh, thermodynamic process that you are going to undergo is going to generate heat. So you, you are pretty much stuck generating heat all the time, right? So you can think of a lot of things as being thermal sources. Depends on if you want that to be um, uh, how you want it to be modeled, but a lot of times you can uh, model it as either an ideal heat flow rate source uh, that provides arbitrary heat flow rate to a system independent of the temperature across it, which depends on the system. So I, I would say this would be a good example of this would be 
um, like a uh, so a resistive heater is a really common one. This is one where you're actually trying to generate heat. But let's also choose an example where you're not trying to generate heat, but it's a byproduct of what you're doing. Um, a good example would be like a um, microprocessor. So the point of a microprocessor is not to generate heat, but you do generate heat when you run a microprocessor, right? And in fact, that is a problem that if you got really into heat transfer and you got good at um, thermal management um, techniques, there are a lot of good jobs in that, um, in specifically cooling down microprocessors, uh, especially for servers. Heat management in server farms is a big problem right now because um, it scales. So if you improve things by 1%, 1% could be billions of dollars <laughs> so, over a long time, but yeah. Uh, your thermal management of, of heat generation that is a byproduct is actually probably much more common than modeling systems that have uh, intentional heating going on. So microprocessors, um, I already mentioned engines before, motors, or another one that generate heat and you need to cool them down. Um, great, an ideal temperature source. So these are all things that like uh, are gonna generate heat and you can, you can come up with a power uh, value that would be the source. Like, okay, the peak Q is gonna be this or maybe the, the profile of Q, depending on, you know, over time it's gonna change. Uh, a temperature source is an ideal element, or is an element that provides an arbitrary temperature to a system independent of heat flow through it, which depends on the system. So we'll do an example in a minute that has a temperature uh, source associated with it. But if it's, if it's something that, like, the temperature is the thing that's, that's uh, either independently specified or um, the thing that is most easily considered to be the, the defining characteristic of what it is that's providing thermal energy, then you would have an ideal temperature source or a temperature source. Generalized elements and variable types. So in keeping with the definitions of chapter one of these notes, temperature T is an across variable and heat flow rate Q is a through variable. Consequently, the thermal capacitor is considered an A type energy storage element Thermal resistor is considered to be a D-type energy dissipative element, which is what we call the D-type element, although it does not actually dissipate energy, so that's important to remember. Um, it's kind of a misnomer to call it a D-type, but uh, we do call it a D-type because it does resist its, uh, uh, the flow of heat, and it relates across and through variables algebraically, both signature characteristics of D-type elements. So it's pretty much like a D-type, but it does have that one important distinction. Temperature sources are then across variable sources and heat flow rate sources are through variable sources. So now we'll do this example. Um, and we're just gonna do it really quickly. I, I don't know if we're gonna have people breathing down our necks or not, but uh, it's a fun problem. Uh, about Careless Carlton, who left a huge pot of water uh, on the stove. Worst, a cast iron pan is bumped so that it is in solid contact with the pot and his glass fish tank, which was carelessly left to the, uh, next to the stove. I know. Careless. Careless. Draw a linear graph of the sad situation to determine what considerations determine if Careless Carlton's fish goes from winter to dinner. Okay. So... This is the sort of picture we've got. Um, could be. He's got some eyebrows now. He's pretty scared. He gets it. He's trying to figure out what's going on here. So th this is, we're going to call this a temperature source because boiling water is pretty much at 100 C, right? So we're going to assume that that's at 100 C. There's going to be this interface contact here, which has quite a bit of thermal resistance. So whenever you have two 
different objects that are in contact and you're thinking about the, the uh, uh, conduction through it, uh, that's going to be a significant amount of resistance. Through the pan is going to have a resistance. We could consider the pan to actually store some thermal energy too. Um, I, I didn't include that in the figure, but we could also have a thermal capacitance for the pan. That would be reasonable. But we're going to say it resists uh, some of the heat flow through it. We have another interface here, which is going to resist some heat flow. And then we're going to heat up this tank of water, uh, which is certainly going to be able to hold quite a bit of energy. The, the, the specific heat capacity for water is significant, and so uh, it can store a lot of thermal energy. And then we've got this temperature that it, it's going to increase, and uh, we're potentially, go once this temperature starts to increase, we're going to dissipate some heat from this tank. And so you're going to get some sort of convection that's going to happen, and I'll, we'll model that with R5. So there's going to be some air that will be moving around, and uh, uh, maybe some natural convection, heat rising, and all that hot air rising and cool air coming in. Uh, so we get some convection, and we're also going to get some uh, uh, conduction into whatever surface this is sitting on. Okay. So let's draw a linear graph for this, and let's try to figure out if we can determine what is going to govern whether or not this fish is going to be okay. So we're going to model the uh, pot of boiling water to be a temperature source. Um, and of course, it's going to be 100 C. It's going to drop from high temperature to low temperature. Let's call this reference temperature uh, just maybe like 0 C. Okay, and we'll go through those three resistances, right? R1 for the first interface, R2 for the pan itself, and then R3 for the second interface. And then we've got this thermal capacitance, C, okay? And finally, we've got our, our two modes of, of heat transfer that dissipate heat from the, uh, uh, from this capacitor. So we've got R4, which was the conduction into the counter, and we have R5, which is the convection. So. Let's imagine for just a moment, uh, just so that we can like, think through this uh, uh, at a high level, let's imagine that our R4 and our R5 were infinitely large, okay? So that no heat's going to flow out of the tank through R4 and R5. So we're going to just have this temperature source that increases here. It's going to get hot on this side of the pan. And then there's going to be this resistance to the temperature uh, or to the heat flowing but it's going to flow right and remember if you have a temperature difference across something um, you're going to get heat flow through it so you can think of all of this as being one resistance if we wanted to and this is kind of like an rc circuit if r4 and r5 are so large that that, that no heat's going to flow through them it's, it's like an rc circuit and until Tc is equal to the source temperature, there's always going to be heat flowing, right? So even though it would slow down as they approach each other, eventually, or like at T equals infinity, at time it goes to infinity, the temperature of this capacitor would get to the temperature of the boiling water in the pan. So if R4, so if R4 um, and R5 are large, Tc goes to Ts equals 100C, and 
we eat? Fish is dinner. Um, if well, it would get it would get to it would get to boiling. It get to boiling. So our four and our five uh, uh, are small. What happens then? So as the as the fish tank heats up, we get all this heat transfer because if our four and our five conduct heat away really easily, say it's connected to like it's connected to the counter and the counter is like a big chunk of copper that's like maybe cooled to some really low temperature or something like that. Then our, or even just cooled to zero. See. Um, it's an infinitely large block of copper at zero. Um, then R4 and R5 are just going to suck all of the temperature out of this thing, and it's not going to stay at 100 C. It's not going to ever get to 100 C. It's going to stay cool. So, um, so T, uh, TC... Uh, uh, is... I w I'll, I'll say I'll just say TC is less than TS. Um, maybe maybe if it's small, then much less than TS. And I guess um, we starve. I don't know. I'm friends. I'm friends with a vegan, and she's giving me all kinds of shit about eating animals. I have a really hard time getting upset about it, though. <laughs> like, I do actually feel bad about some of it, but not for fish. I don't. I don't feel bad about fish, at all. Fish are dumb. Yeah, I do feel bad about like cows, probably the most. Cow, like mammals, are a little little tougher, but yeah. So I see that argument, even though I still do eat. She, she's like, you're a hypocrite. And I'm like, yeah, I know. Because I kind of do feel bad about it, but I still eat it. So, yeah, I don't know. Anyways, that was veganism for a minute. Um, so there you go. That's thermal systems. And we'll do uh, the next two lectures are examples. But I guess we'll do them on Wednesday. All right. Have a good weekend, guys.